Well, welcome everybody uh, back to this offshoot of the Drawing Board podcast with the Terrible Face podcast, branching into the world of video and getting to meet the people who write on the site. Um, today, I'm very excited to be here with uh, Aaron and Camus, our uh, author who we are spotlighting today. Um, if you were uh, lucky enough to dive into his recent article about Nier Automata, um, then you'll be familiar with his kind of take on games, and that's what we're going to be diving into today. Um, but first, before we kind of go into the most recent article and then what you're kind of looking to do next, um, I think this is the first time you and I are getting a chance to talk about your article on The Witness, a game I haven't played but know a lot about because of, uh, because of Blow. So I think like I, I'm just nominally familiar with all of his work and reading your article was I think a really nuanced um, way to get involved with his work. And without getting too into the article uh, in my question here, I do wanna say that as somebody else on the site who often dives into um, sort of uh, shortcomings of video games, like in my Canon series, I'll often talk about things that I wish had been done differently or things that seem to have been lacking. Um, I really thought that your approach in that first article was was really interesting and a great way for me to kind of come to understand that game and this guy's work. So I wanted to, if you're fine with it, sort of start with what sort of led you to write that article, what your experience with um, John Blow and his work is before that, and sort of why you were thinking about it the way you were. Well, I think it's a, a great question and it really just leads all the way back to how I got involved with the terrible fate. But basically, I can't remember how I heard about The Witness. I think I was just in the mood for a difficult puzzle game. So I looked up like, what's a hard puzzle game I could I could find? And I saw The Witness. I'm like, hey, this one looks really cool. I'll check it out. So I played through it, really enjoyed it, had a fun time, really stimulated the brain cells there, and then, and then just kind of left it. And then I'm browsing YouTube one day and I see a YouTube video which had a great title and it was titled The Witness, a great game that you shouldn't play. I was like, hey, I've played that game. It is a great game, but why shouldn't I play it? So I watched the video and the the guy who, who made it is talking about how a lot of the game's shortcomings, but also a lot of the game's the strengths. And I just, it, it really resonated with, with my playthrough. But the thing that really got me and made me think that The Witness was something special was when he got to the point in the video and he mentioned the environmental puzzles which if you've read the article you should you should know about that but me on my first playthrough did not find a single environmental puzzle so seeing that made me think okay i played this game wrong what else did i miss and so after watching that video i said i have to go back i have to go play this game again but that 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 realization that i missed something so integral to the experience was pretty pretty much the jumping point for this article because how could I miss something so interesting, so unique, and so vital to what the witness is trying to do? And so that really spawned the idea of okay, what, why didn't this, why did this happen? Why did it happen this way? And mm. is it a bad thing? And so as I go through and play the witness again, I'm paying more attention to all this, all the extra details that I didn't see the first time, taking a lot of notes very in-depth, did about as much content as I could. And that's when I started to see that as you explore through all the content in The Witness, there's so much of it and it's so deliberately minimalist and hidden from you. I was like, this mm -hmm. is, it's, it's really cool, but I think it, it, it goes too far. And I'm someone who really likes minimalist type games. I love Journey, Abzu, like all sorts of these ones that try to tell a story in as little words as possible. And just to see the witness do something so different, but in a way that I think failed was really compelling to me. It was really interesting. And that's why I really wanted to highlight it. Well, it's, it's really funny that you kind of, you tell the story of, you know, somebody kind of mentions something and you're like, oh, I missed that. I really want to go back with a notebook and kind of like, you know, see what was going on there. And as I was uh, reading your article, I remember thinking like, 
that's like that's how I feel about uh, Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. And then at the bottom of your article, <laughs> you're like, oh, by the way, this game is a is an example of you know this sort of minimalism coming to the forefront. So, do you find yourself like in your video game playing history? You mentioned um, like Abzu and games like that. Do you find that you're you sort of gravitate towards those games, which is why you kind of had this take on the on the witness? Yeah, I mean, you could say I definitely am drawn towards the quote unquote artsy games, the games yeah, that sure. like you you look, you play them, and you're like, okay, this is obviously trying to be something more than just a game, and I really like right. that because it it is it takes what we traditionally see as video games and tries to move beyond it, and that's really interesting. So yeah, going to the witness, I went into it wanting a puzzle game, and came out with it. Okay, this is a puzzle game, but there's a lot more going on here, and I think that's super interesting. Yeah, Camus, I, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, as I was getting ready for this chat uh, and excited about this chat, I went back through our first um, conversations, like working through and workshopping the idea that would become the witness article. Because for anyone who's listening and interested, uh, this doesn't always come through in the finished products of the analyses that we publish. But uh, we go through a lot of drafts and just back and forth conversation among the team uh, before those final products that you see come to fruition. And it was interesting to me because I'd forgotten that you first build this as basically an argument that the witness was kind of this cosmic joke where we missed the punchline because it was trying to do something and kind of failed at it in a funny way. Uh, I, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that since it didn't really end up making it into the final version of the argument. Yeah, that really goes back to the video that influenced me to, to write the article, really, because it, one of the, the theories that the, the maker of the video had he, he thought that it was just a giant like meta joke that Jonathan Blow was just pranking everybody. And I saw that and I was like, that's a, that's a really interesting take because I, Jonathan Blow has made one game before this and it was Braid, which that that's shot him up into popularity. And then like seven years later, he comes out with a second game. And to think of that, he spends seven years on a game only to just say, ha ha, funny joke. I, I thought that was really interesting. And as you go through and, and look at this argument as to po like possibly it being a joke, it really does. It's it is oddly compelling. And so when I when I went through uh, playing the game the second time, I was looking for all of these these inconsistencies where like it just there was a bunch of content that just did not make sense. You're like, why is this here? What's the point? And it it really does lend towards that idea that am I being played here? Like, is, yeah. is he trying to bait me in and then, and then pull a bait and switch and then say, huh, you wasted all your time looking for all this stuff. It means nothing. Was, think, was that the I whole point? There's, I think there's, there's a, uh, you know, I guess the, the fun in it is, is looking at it that way because I, ha while I haven't played the witness, I have played braid and <laughs> braid. I think it's a very fair reading of Braid to say this man has contempt for video games and those who play them. <laughs> like it kind of comes off as like you, you jerk, look at what you're actually doing, you know? And I think that like this whole reverse Mario story and everything. And I think that there's, there's something to be said, of course, about just a character kind of going through um, this self-actualized story of kind of coming to terms with the fact that he might actually be the bad guy. But I remember when I played that, obviously we're playing as this character and seeing all of this and kind of piecing things together kind of just leaves you with a sour taste in your mouth. So the idea that The Witness is seven a seven year like, haha, tricked you guys. I just, uh, I spent seven years making this game just to shove a big middle finger in your face. It's a really interesting idea. And not something that I think, that kind of goes into something that we've talked about on, on the site before a lot like this auteur theory right and i kind of i don't think this is true um of jonathan blow necessarily although it might be true of one other auteur that we're going to be talking about um there's not really like an andy kaufman of video games like a guy who's just all it's all performance and it's all a joke and it's all a trick um but i i love the idea that jonathan blow is getting to that point and it's either him or the guy who made Getting Over It, right? Uh, Yoko Taro might fall into that too, but yeah, definitely the Getting Over It quap guy. 
Oh my God. Well, while we're already on this weird meta thread, I, I want to, I wanted to ask this question of you, Camus, about your witness article, but Dan, I'd also be really interested for your thoughts because it occurs to me, I have kind of the, the two representatives of probably like the most um, critical articles of with the terrible fate here. And I don't mean that in terms of critical in the sense of criticism. I mean it in terms of like, very trenchant arguments about something that goes wrong with a game, right? Camus, you really interestingly in, in your first article do what's basically a takedown. I mean, a very well thought out argument, but a takedown of the witness, right? Which is especially interesting since as we'll be talking about later, your newest article is basically the opposite of that. It's a love letter to Nero Automata. And Dan, you know, you're gonna hate me for even bringing this up, but you are also the author of among many other better renowned things, the infamous Five Nights at Freddy's piece that you did for the canon, where you basically yes. just unloaded on it, right? And so I, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on kind of how you see the relationship between positive and negative uh, video game criticism, and maybe especially in your case, Camus, since it was your first article, what drew you to this kind of perspective of pointing out uh, where a game could have done better, let's say, to put it nicely, as opposed to digging into what makes a great game so great. Well, I guess I should start by saying my criticism for The Witness comes from a place of love. I love the game. I think it's a great game. It has a lot of problems. And that's why I'm so critical of it, because I'm, I'm the person that thinks if you're a fan of something, you should be its biggest critic. You should know its flaws so that you can hope for something to be better. And it's like, I want The Witness... When I see what Jonathan Blow wanted to do, I'm like, that's super cool. That's a great idea. I just don't think he did it right. And I think by, as someone who wants to see video games be better and wants to see them go to these new heights, pointing out games that do things wrong is just as important as pointing out games that do things right. Because by learning where the, the flaws are, you can fix those flaws. And by learning what, what, what is done right, you can take that and you can, you can learn from all examples. And I don't think there's not necessarily a greater significance to me choosing to be a critical in the first article. It's just it's just what what was what came to me. Yeah, I think um, I totally agree with you on the on the uh, thought that it comes from a place of love. I think that <laughs> my my Five Nights at Freddy's article, you know, that might be one for our critical review series, Aaron, because I think. Um, the way that I approached that was less about the game and more about the world surrounding it and the, uh, you know, what it sort of did to game gaming discourse and survival horror game discourse and like all these other things, right? And I think that um, my frustration with it was like uh, sort of similar where I'm such a fan of horror games that I think that the the idea of that, the concept of that story and that game is really smart and it's really effective. The problem is everything that propped up around it. And so I think from a more mature standpoint nowadays, because that was like four years ago, probably, um, I think I would, I would change it to be sort of, this is why this is not so good. Um, but to Camus's point, I think that it is, it is fun, I think, to, to kind of do a takedown, right? Because it's, it's fun in the sense that um, it's, it's a good time to sort of point out things that are bad or things that weren't done so well or things that are frustrating. And it's kind of fun to be hyperbolic. But I think that the next step in that is something that Camus does really well in that first article that he wrote for us, which is, but here is why I'm so passionate about these things, right? I'm not just angry or, or frustrated because, you know, I'm the angry game smasher and I hate video games. <laughs> it's because I love them. And I think what I got out of that article, especially Camus, is like this idea that, you know, one of the more frustrating things, I think, especially for people like us, is when we play a game where we're like, that is such a good idea and they just didn't do it. They just didn't, they didn't do it to the full fruition. Right. And it's, you're almost angry that like that idea is out there now and the precedent for it is this thing that doesn't quite measure up to what you hope the idea would be. 
You know what I mean? So I think that it's fun to be vitriolic, but it comes from a place of like, I'm so, I'm not angry, son. I'm frustrated. <laughs> so, yeah. But I That's think, you know, that, that may be a very good segue into um, your most recent article, because I think that um, reading it, it's it's just as reading your article on The Witness, it was very clear that you like this game and the ideas that are in it. You just sort of wish that things had been done a little differently. It's very clear in the near article that you're a big fan of this guy, uh, this guy's work and what he did in the game overall. And again, I feel like you're kind of a man after my own heart with the way I write sort of canon articles because I feel like you, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm speaking out of turn for you, but that, but that E ending that you talk about, I feel like may have been a moment where you were like, I understand and appreciate everything this game is doing because of this segment. Like this is a crystallizing kind of moment and I want to talk about it and just explain how great it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, that, that's definitely part of it. Cause I remember when I played, I played Nier Automata twice. The first time I I'd heard so much about it. I was like, okay, I'm a guy who loves a good video game story. I'll go play it. And I sat down one weekend, busted through that story. And I was like, that was great. I was like, you know, I don't think I did the game justice. So I went back and played it like a month later and did all the side quests and whatnot. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in the side quests too, not just the main story. But I still, like ending E is just, the it's I literally, it is the hardest part to do in a game is to make that last hour like the best part. You want to go off on a high note. Yeah. And let me tell you, ending E is the high note of Nier Automata, in my opinion. It's yeah, so it's funny a, it's because, um, yeah, it, it, Dan and I, you know, we were just talking um, on a, a postmortem that we did for the Final Fantasy VII Remake series about how, like, the not even the last act, but, like, the grand finale of JRPGs can so often make or break them. And Nier Automata, it seems like, um, like that's cranked up to 11 in the sense of, you know, it has so many endings even main story endings such that each of them is almost more of a miniature climax or an act break than an actual ending. Uh, but your, your piece does a great job of capturing how all of that momentum is really realized uh, in, in ending E in a way that's just so satisfying. And, you know, there's a reason why, as you say in your article, so many people have been talking about it ever since it came out. Right. I mean, it really is that amount of an impact. Uh, I'd love before we, dive into the particulars of the article of which there are so many uh you know maybe just to step back for a minute Camus, because one of the things that you actually mention in your bio on the site is how this ending in particular was transformative to you on your path for how you think about video games and you, you've kind of alluded to uh in the conversation so far how you know i mean obviously you're an analyst and with a terrible fate you love a great video game story but maybe you could give uh us and our audience just a little more color as to how you discovered them and how your views on games have evolved over time because it really strikes me reviewing your articles just for this conversation that um, I, I can feel your history with games in them as, you know, someone who started out thinking of games just as games and has become increasingly excited over the years about their potential as a narrative medium. Yeah, I mean, I guess the place to start is what I consider to be the first real game that I played, and that was Ocarina of Time. Great place to start. And uh, I, I played it, I mean, before that I played like, you know, we we wear trash game, like all sorts of stuff. But when we got our chicken our, shoot, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> we got our 3DS and we got the, the 3D remake of Ocarina of Time, it was a whole world open. I was like, this game is great. And it was so great that I replayed it 50 times back to back. And of course, I was like 10 years old. Like, this game's so good. I'm just going to keep playing it over and over and over again. But now I can't stand it. <laughs> I played it so much. <laughs> I haven't touched that game ever since. So that was really the, the starting point. And from there, I just, you know, I just took what, what came. I became a big fan of Zelda at that point, you know, dove, dove into Twilight Princess and the other Zelda games. And I remember uh, the, basically the off point is uh, as I was digging more into Zelda, 
I found Majora's Mask. And the idea of Majora's Mask being this very mature, very profound Zelda, it, it, it just really captivated me. And I, I just started digging into it and like watching all these videos. And I'm like, it's like, this is so weird. This isn't the Zelda I know. And I ended up <laughs> I ended up watching a let's play of someone play the game. And this same the same let's player ended up playing Xenoblade Chronicles at about the same time I was watching the Majora's Mask let's play. And I was like, okay. So I'm, I started watching it. And then I was like, this game looks really good. So I pick it up. I start playing it. And my gosh, I was blown, blown out the water. I mean, it was, it was insane. I was like, this game is amazing. I've never seen anything like this before. And I think Xenoblade Chronicles was really the, the point when it shifted. And it shifted a lot in my life, but that, that's a longer story. But when I played Xenoblade Chronicles, I was like, okay, games are no longer games. They, they, they can be some really powerful narrative devices. And, and so from that point, I started delving into these larger narratives, like with JRPGs. And I started branching out into to more unique game genres. And then that just years went by. And then Nier Automata comes out. I hear a lot of people talking about it. I'm like, okay, might as well check it out. Check it out, play through it, get through ending and I'm like, that was amazing. I've never seen anything like that. It was the same thing like with Zima. I've never seen anything like that before. But on this time, I'm in high school. I'm like, I got to talk about this. I got to tell somebody about this. And long story short, that it, it ended up leading me to With a Terrible Fate. And although I didn't write my first article about it, it was definitely the the motivator behind me starting to write about video games. Boy, Majora's That's Mask awesome. and Xenoblade Chronicles. Those uh, sound like some games I'll have to try out sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto me with Ocarina of Time. I might have to yeah, check it no out. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, that's so funny though. I don't, Dan, I don't know if you have a game like that, uh, like you're talking about Camus, where you discovered it as a kid and just played the crap out of it so that you can no longer even play it. Because I definitely did. That was me with my first JRPG, Tales of Symphonia, where I, I remember so vividly even now the feeling you described where when you discover one of those like interactive stories for the first time, it sounds so trite now that we you know, talk about interactive stories every day with each other and on the site. Uh, but when it's something that's totally novel to you, it's like you, ju you just have to eat it up and play it a million times, at least if you're someone like me. Like I, I must have played Tales of Symphonia back to back to back to back, like upwards of 15 times uh, back in the days when I rented it from Blockbuster because Blockbuster gaming was still a thing. Um, did you have a game like that, Dan? Um, I, I still play, I don't think I've ever burned myself out on a game apart from maybe Dark Souls 2, apparently. but, um, well, that's, a, that's no, different, you know, that's, that's different, different. <laughs> as a, as a kid though, I, I had a, um, so I think that the game that, um, you know, and, and people who are familiar with my work will know that Ocarina of Time is the game where I realized, oh, these are, these are very special, um, and very different from books and, and movies and things like that. And I was I was pretty young when I played that. Um, but <laughs> the moment that that was when I think I, I started thinking about them very critically, like even from a really young age, 13, 14. But the first time a game truly blew me away, and I've told this story before in one of my articles, but it was in, so the game that got me into games was Pokemon Blue. And I played Pokemon Blue until I was blue in the face. And then Pokemon Gold and Silver came out. And I love that game even more. And what, what totally blew my like eight-year-old mind was that at the end of it, you, you have a battle with the character from the first game. And it was the first time where, I'm, where I realized like, oh, I'm fighting me. This is, this is the guy that I was, you know? And I just remember thinking, I don't get that with movies. And so that, that was the one that, I'm not, I'm not sick of it, but I do think of that as like the, the crystallizing moment for me. But um, I love that, <laughs> I think, Camus, you and my younger brother may share the feeling of like, I played Ocarina of Time until the disc was, or the cartridge was, you know, turned into dust and now I can't look at it, so. <laughs> yeah. But no, I think uh, 
it's funny. I think that as as we definitely um, can tell from the people that we work with and talk to, Zelda definitely has a very sort of it's like a gateway drug. I think for the way that we think about games. <laughs> So I love that I love that Xenoblade was the next step. I think that that's awesome. And then I feel like some somehow in my head, Ocarina of Time to Xenoblade to Nier Automata is a very natural progression. <laughs> I think what you what you've just said, Dan, to paraphrase you, is that Yoko Taro is the hard drugs of video game storytelling. And like, yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> I, I think he'd be the first to agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's actually he's just off screen over here. He he's he hangs out at my house. <laughs> Not uh, well, vigorously in his Emil head. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so let's talk. Let's talk in earnest about that guy and his work because something that I I really appreciate about your article, Camus, is that you kind of break down something that I. So, to back up a step, in our last conversation that Aaron mentioned about the Final Fantasy VII remake, we walked another analyst, Adam sort of, or he walked us through his sort of breakdown of how he writes his own articles. And he had mentioned that it's sort of like his process is he notices something that's strange and then he wonders, okay, why is that strange? And then he tries to codify it and then he just sort of branches out from there. And I think that um, what I really like about your Nier Automata piece is that um, it felt to me very much like the experience that I had playing um, not just that ending, but like a lot of Nier Automata in general of like, oh, this is incredible. And I can't process why right now because so many things are going on and I'm just absorbing it. And I really like that you took the approach of breaking it down to its components and explaining how individually they're all excellent, but when put together, it's this incredible symphony that you just weren't expecting at the end of a game uh, of any kind of game like that. And I, I would like to hear how you kind of did it, did it come to you as in the order that you wrote it or were you just kind of all over the place? How did you kind of come to that? Well, I think the first thing I noticed about ending when I played it is that it was so cohesive. I was like, I, when I played it, I was like, okay, the guy who made this knew what he was going to do and he designed it specifically around that. Hmm. And so from that point, it was really just, okay, so we know what he's trying to do. Let's break it down and see how each of these individual parts do what that thing is. And that's reflected in the structure of the article where we just say, okay, let's break it into each of its individual pieces, look <laughs> at them individually. And then as we look at more of them, let's put it all together. We're building a puzzle that leads to us, leads us to this final whole. You mentioned, uh, and Aaron, I saw your hand move to unmute, so I'll kick it over to you in a second. But I, I was going to say too, um, you mentioned like, oh, it seems like this guy built everything around this moment. And I feel like um, if there's like a, if there's a sentence for Yoko Taro as an auteur, it's he had an idea and built an entire, not just game, but uh, novel, uh, play <laughs> oh, <a> soundtrack <laughs> he hired a chorus line he <laughs> like he's just like i gotta he's like david lynch like i'm gonna put everything in it just to get to this idea i think uh, similarly um Camus, i know i mentioned this to you in our correspondence but i have to gush about it for a moment um in case the audience who hopefully has read your article missed this um one of the things that we thought about a lot uh, while you were putting the article together was the best way to um, kind of exactly as you were just talking about, show how all of these different modes of storytelling intermesh in a cohesive way, right? Which from a presentational standpoint, having already done the analysis is very challenging, right? Because you want to show how all of these different modes are not just working on their own, but also interacting since that's the whole point of what you're talking about with the endings cohesiveness, but you also don't want to unnecessarily belabor the point for your audience, right? By going through the whole motions of reintroducing, for instance, the visual mode of storytelling, which is the first one you talk about uh, once you go through the um, 
I forget if I said visual or verbal. Verbal is the first one you talk about. Excuse me if I misspoke. But then when you talk about the subsequent ones of visual and um, auditory, right, you have to rehash the ones that came before in order to show how they're all interconnected, right? But I think the way in which you do that is so interesting and fitting uh, in terms of marrying your form with the content that you're talking about, namely near, because as anyone who's played near and near automata knows, uh, or Drakengard for that matter, right? The entire mode of storytelling that's spun out there is uh, basically gradually accessing more of the story and understanding of the world by going through the same paces of the plot multiple times, right? And so I just, I loved how in the, in the first instance, you added these layers of storytelling one after another in a way that was very much almost in itself a tribute to Nier and to Yoko Taro's storytelling, uh, such that your analysis really meshed with the game for that reason. But also I was thinking about it more after I told you that um, initially, and I think it's also really fitting that the final mode of storytelling you talk about, at least before you talk about um, the kind of meta level of storytelling of players engaging with other players, but the last vanilla level, so to speak, in terms of kinds of content is the auditory mode of storytelling, right? Which centrally features the choir that sings Weight of the World as the ending goes on. And it was just so interesting to me to think about that too, in terms of music composition, uh, and as I, I think you mentioned, Dan, a little while ago, the, this notion of how the game itself is almost like a symphony, right, where there are these different parts or different melodies and harmonies that are gradually brought in over time, right? And I, the more I was reflecting on that, in large part, thanks to the form you gave your analysis, the more I came to think of ending E not just as something that is cohesive, but also something that is kind of symphonic in terms of the way it introduces these different notes and these different calls and responses in terms of what the player does, uh, all to reinforce this singular theme of, of triumphing and persisting in the face of certain defeat. So I, I think it's, it's very nuanced and cool the way that you do that, not only in terms of the substance of your analysis, but also in terms of the very form that you give it. Um, that's, that's not something that a lot of analysts think about, but I think it makes all the difference in terms of grasping your ideas. Well, I, it wasn't really intentional, honestly, but then again, it's like, that's how, like some of the best art is made. It just happens that way. Right. You ask the artist and you know, I feel like, well, you know, I didn't intend it to be that, but sure, whatever. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, you've worked with me enough to know how much, or should I say how little I care about authorial intent. So that's fine. <laughs> that's a, that's an argument for another day. <laughs> that's right. We'll Although, be here all night. <laughs> I will, I will say that. <laughs> Yoko Taro may be the uh, the uh, exception that proves the rule on death to the author, where it's like, no, actually, wait a minute, let's hear what Yoko Taro has to say. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh man, but no, I think um, yeah, it just uh, like any any great article that that we put out, it made me want to go and play that part again, and then I thought, well, I just want to go and play near automata again and then that made me think well i just want to play near and just sort of going back and i think that um you know I, the uh the idea that 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 ending is so cohesive um it's just it's such a cool sort of look into how that game is put together and how um video games can be can be put together in a way that um strengthens all of their best parts. And something I wanted to pick your brain about was, like I said earlier, I really like the examples you used um, in each of those parts for like games that, you know, they have, they have strong themes, they have strong sort of, um, like clearly they have a point and they do it fairly well, but it's not quite what that ending is doing. And I wanted to kind of ask you, like, how did you like, were you thinking about that, um, like, after, when you started to think about putting this article together, did you start thinking, like, oh, and you know, getting over it, like, I'm definitely frustrated by getting over it, but it's not, like, the setting of it isn't enhancing the frustration, it's just the actual 
thing I have to get over. It's not like in the ending where all of a sudden all of these other um, attacks are coming at me as the difficulty progresses, right? So I, I'd like to kind of hear how did you how did you kind of link to those examples in your head? Well, as I was going through it, and as we were developing the the main argument more, it you, the natural progression is okay. If I'm going to say what this game does is better than what other games do, I naturally have to compare it to other games to show why it's doing something different. So when we reached that point, I was like, okay, well now I got to find some games that are not not bad. Right. I like I don't want to I don't want to go out and say, hey, getting over it's bad because it doesn't do what NE does. No, by no means. Getting over it is is it's great. It's a short little game. It's a great experience that has a very fun little twist. But you look at getting over it and then you look at NE and you're like, okay, both are good, but NE is doing something different. And I love when things do things different because I mean if if everything does the same thing over and over again, it gets boring. And so as I was just, I was thinking, gosh, trying to organize my thoughts. As I was going through ending and saying, okay, well, it does all this unique stuff. We need to compare it to other games to show why what it's doing is significant and important to the future of video games. And so it was just, okay, well, let's see what other games have this similar theming and, and find these, these comparisons that we can make between the two to as so as to best highlight how NEE is doing something unique and innovative. Yeah, well, I, I, um, like I said, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, Dan, uh, you go ahead. I was just gonna very quickly say, I think, uh, you know, you, um, you bring up a point that, that I think is really, um, it's important because it does, it comes up, but it's hard to kind of know, it's hard to know why it comes up and how you should sort of parse it. And I think the, that idea is, well, so to keep with getting over it, like getting over it is a really good example of what it is trying to do. It's like, it's very well put together. It's, it's funny. It's frustrating. It's silly. Um, if the goal is to frustrate, um, and then kind of make you feel better about that. I think it does a pretty good job of that. But there's something about a game like Nier Automata where when you play, when you play through it and you get to ending E, you do kind of have that spark where, like you said, Kame, it's like, but this is something different and it's something important and very cool. And I think that it's it's a really smart approach to kind of say, I'm going to take what it was doing here and then look at these other examples and not, you know, uh, take the, the negative root on them, but just explain that like, these are serving different purposes and clearly ending E was thought out in a very specific way to do something, I think totally new, or if not totally new, certainly brilliant in the way that it was, it was executed. Camus, I wanted to ask you something um, else in, in a very similar vein in terms of how and why you see Ending E as groundbreaking, because uh, as, as you talked about a little bit at the beginning of your article, your whole argument rests on this premise, right, that basically video games are doing themselves a disservice as a medium to the extent that they introduce content that is not interactive because the defining feature of them is their interactivity, right? That's that's a super interesting claim, frankly, uh, and something I'm interested in because, at least to my mind, it seems like a lot of the interesting content in video games is not always interactive, but kind of a, a blend of some things that are interactive and some things that are not, right? And so I'd love to uh, hear you expound a little bit more about that and, and why it is that you think it's essential for video games progress as a storytelling medium that they stretch their interactive nature uh, to the utmost in, in any way that they can. This is a very good question and it, it goes at least to some thoughts that I want to say a lot. And I guess to just start it off, I see, I don't think Near Automata's ending E is like the the, the best video game stories can be. I think, and to be hyperbolic, 
fully acknowledged, I think it's the best piece of video game storytelling that we currently have right now. And it's because of what I outlined in the article that it uses the medium to its fullest potential. It takes it to the, the natural extent. But I think ending E really has just raised the bar and we're not at the top. I think, imagine, the, the one that gets me really going is imagine a game that, it, who knows how long it would be. And th this is the, the hard part because games are very different as an artistic medium, something like a book where anyone who knows how to read or write can write a book. Whereas making a game, that takes a lot of time and money. But imagine a game that is like a 20 hour game, let's say a 20 hour game that is as meticulously crafted as ending E the whole way through. Imagine that, that gets me really excited. And of course it's not gonna happen for a long time because to do that, you'd have to be, it would have to be very, you'd have to have a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of people working on it and it would be very difficult. But I like to imagine that as being the end point. It's like when we reach that point, that's when we know games have, have made it to where they need to be in terms of storytelling potential, where they, they use all of their assets available to them to create these distinct narratives. I mean, video games are interactive and that's what makes them unique. I mean, because I mean, I can watch a movie and, and experience a good story, but playing a story and being the person in the story via the avatar is, is especially unique. And as for games to use interactivity, that's their, their strong suit. And I see ending E as somewhat of a call to action it says, okay, See, you see this right here? This is what we need to be doing. And this is what I love about Yoko Taro because, I mean, no, no criticism, no, not to put down anybody else, but there are certain developers and directors in the industry that get a lot of credit that I think deserves to be put on other people who are doing the harder work to push the medium forward. One of those people being Yoko Taro. He's, he's really pushing the boundaries. And this segues into something that, I mean, we talked about earlier with, the idea of, of criticism and learning from the mistakes. And I think when you look at Nier Automata, I think it's a fantastic evolution of the original Nier. And Aaron, you might disagree with this statement, but I view the original Nier as a game with a lot of great ideas that was executed poorly in a lot of parts. But I look at Nier Automata and I see Yoko Taro saying, okay, here's what worked in Nier. Here's what didn't work. Let's fix what didn't work and let's just amplify the good. And I think I just say, I cannot wait to see what Yoko Taro does next. I mean, if the, he, he thinks Nier Automata is a terrible game. He said it multiple <laughs> times. If this is a terrible game to him, I don't know what was a great game. So it just, the ending E, I think, represents a very unique future for video games. And if developers see it and learn from it, it can lead to some very fascinating, unique experiences down the line. I actually, I actually hear that the next uh, Yoko Taro uh, video game is just going to be a pomegranate and a no mask, and you just have to like. That's what he thinks a real <laughs> video game, <laughs> because Nier Automata was a failure. It's like just get more and more. Well, I, I think that um, you you hit on something that uh, we kind of alluded to earlier, right? Like the idea of a whole game being created like that, I think, is very exciting. And I, I have a lot of hope that that's where video games are going for two reasons. One, I think because um, people who play video games, um, there's, there's two, there's many kinds of video game players, but for this example, there's two kinds. There are people who kind of are maybe old enough to have seen like progression happen. And then there are people who like, started playing when the progression was at a very certain point. And it's kind of like, and I, what I mean by that is the idea of um, the end of say, so you mentioned some other, uh, or you vaguely alluded to some other creators, and I'm going to mention one who I think is still very, very smart about what he does, but is on the older side of things, which is Hideo Kojima. He, he may have, I figured you might've been alluding to him, <laughs> but good night, he, uh, good night it. yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice poker face, but, but I think, um, you know, to your point, when I, when I think about Nier Automata's ending E, I think that Yoko Taro is somebody who saw 
the end of say Metal Gear Solid 2 and said, I see what you're doing, I can do it better and I'm going to, you know? And I think that um, we're at this point in video game development and storytelling and the, cons you know, people consuming those stories, we're at a point now where I think that people are ready for something like that. They've realized that video games have this kind of, um, as you said, it's the interactive medium. Why not use everything available to you instead of being like an old fashioned Hideo Kojima and saying, well, I just really wanna make movies. It's like, well, that's great. Silent Hill 2 is one of the greatest video games ever created, partially because it is a very good movie <laughs> that has a lot of good interactivity in it. And I think that um, seeing something like Ending E getting the recognition it deserves, I think speaks to the fact that people do understand, you know, oh, this is what makes games special. I can't wait to see more of that. Maybe next time it doesn't have to be hidden away as an ending and it can actually be sort of the entire experience. So I think you're, you're hitting on something there and it, it gives me hope because I think that there were nuggets of that in the past that now developers are kind of trying to expand now that maybe the technology and the, the zeitgeist has caught up with them a little bit. I think it's interesting too, Camus, because you know you talk a lot about the uniqueness of video games as a medium, and I know we've had conversations before where I've warned you about using that word because there are other things in the vicinity, like choose your own adventure novels and other you know toy examples that philosophers and academics like to throw out all the time when you say something as strong and definitive of, as like X is unique. They'll say like, oh, what about Y, Z, and blah blah blah. Um, but I think as, as I've been reflecting on it, part of what um, makes your near article so interesting in that capacity, exactly as you're saying, is I think, you know, say what you will about whether video games ought to be fully interactive in the way that you argue they ought to. Um, one thing that I, I think it's fairly incontrovertible, you can say, about video games developing in that way is it can give a lot more clarity to, as you say, the uniqueness of the medium, right? Because just as a movie would never be mistaken for a book because it's this fully audio visual experience, right? Just so would a video game never be mistaken for something interactive like a choose your own adventure novel when not only does it have these other modes of content available to it like the audio visual, but also each of those modes of content uh, is not only made interactive, but also intermeshed in its interactivity to create this singular, cohesive, interactive experience that you're talking about, and that, as best I can think of, really doesn't have any parallel elsewhere. So that's that's very cool, the idea that that could be the way to actually demonstrate and, and in some way bring about the uniqueness of video games as a storytelling craft. Well, on that note, so... Um, I would like to, unless there's anything else you'd like to say, Canis, about um, your recent Near Automata piece, I would, of course, encourage everybody to read it. Um, but I, I am interested to hear, you know, sort of what you're, what you're interested in next, because you had mentioned with, um, when we were talking about your witness piece and your kind of journey through video game storytelling, this Near Automata one's kind of been in the hopper for a while. So do you have any others that you're interested in or any, any games that you're playing that have kind of sparked your interest? Well, the next one, I'm pretty, I'm pretty set on it. It's going to be about Outer Wilds. And if I, I don't know, Dan, if you've played it. I know Aaron has not played it. But if you have not played Outer Wilds, you need to play Outer Wilds. It is absolutely fantastic. I have not been so enthralled with the game since I played Xenoblade Chronicles seven years ago. <laughs> And it, strong it just, praise yeah very good very good stuff and it is going to be it's looking to be a critical review of lauren's article on the outset island effect and we had a conversation going over some ideas and it it seems like we we she really unveiled it for me how outer wilds uses its soundtrack in a very unique way mm. that that could be to be a lot could be learned from and that I think I'm going to be going in with that next. After that, I think I'm I'm really an idea popped in my head recently. I think it's going to be about Dark Souls, and I mean I've mentioned Dark Souls in both of my articles. I mean it, it's it had to happen eventually, 
I mean, I've got two ideas really. One of them is actually something I've given presentations on twice. Once at a, a club that I used to run that was just all, all this stuff, you know, talking talking games as literature. And I also gave it on a radio show, but it's basically uh, an analysis of how Dark Souls uses cyclical game design in, co in cooperation with uh, cyclical storytelling. And it merges those two in a very unique way. But the other idea, and this one popped into my head a couple of days ago, and I'm really jazzed about it, but it's really underdeveloped. But so you both have played the Soul series, correct? Yes. Literally so, countless times, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to assume that you are both at least familiar with Berserk. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I think okay. I more so than Aaron just because of the nature of my whole background. But yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. I'm a super fan of Berserk. I love Berserk so much. And ah, uh, that damn boat. <laughs> it was worth it in the end. It was worth it, it was. in the end. Casca <laughs> came back and it was worth it yeah. in the end. We'll talk more, you and me, Camus. <laughs> I could go on about Berserk all day, but that's a decide. But yeah. I was in in my my field. Uh, I, I watch a lot of stuff about Berserk. A lot of people talk about we want a we want a real Berserk game. Like, like Dark Souls is great. It has a lot of references to Berserk, but we want a real Berserk game. But I also see a lot of people say Dark Souls is the best Berserk game we're ever going to get. And so I was thinking just a couple nights ago, I was like, yeah, Dark Souls is definitely uh, really influenced by Berserk, obviously. And it, even Miyazaki himself has, has expressly no noted that. But I started thinking, what if, what if, and this, this is a cool idea, what if Dark Souls isn't just a reference to berserk what if it's an adaptation of berserk and that I got me thinking love this idea the, it, I th the more i think about it the cooler it gets now obviously the answer is no right of course it's not an adaptation of berserk <laughs> but if we were to look at dark souls as if it were an adaptation of berserk it could reveal some very interesting things about the medium of video games and its potential to adapt other forms of storytelling other other mediums and this is something that goes back to what I say. And I think video games have the potential to surpass Shakespeare in terms of literary, brilliant, literary brilliance, excuse me. And I just think if Dark Souls, if we view Dark Souls as an adaptation to Berserk, what can that teach us about a game's ability to adapt, say, Hamlet? Because Hamlet is very distinct in the way that it's a play and the way it's written. Now, I'm not saying someone would have to like make a game and say, oh, hey, this is Hamlet, the video game. But what if someone made a game that basically took the story of Hamlet and translated it into the medium of a video game? And I think Dark Souls, as viewed through an, the lens of an adaptation of Berserk, could reveal some very unique things. Now, the idea is still in its infancy. I just thought of it a couple of days ago, but I really like it, and I think it could be I, yeah. really compelling. I'm I'm jazzed about that idea, and I would I would urge you as you're thinking about it to because we've we've talked a lot both on the site and at conventions and things like that about the um, uh, the influence of Lovecraft and cosmic horror in Bloodborne. But another thing is that Bloodborne also clear. I mean, even with just the runes, has reference to Berserk, and so I think that it's a really astute observation that Miyazaki and the team at FromSoft may be taking things that they like, like at, I guess the question would be, at what point does it go, at what point do you say it's no longer an homage, it is an adaptation, right? I think that it's, it's an adaptive form of the ideas or themes of a certain body of work. I think that that is a really interesting idea. Um, and I would love to see you explore that. And if you want to talk about Berserk, I'm your man. <laughs> so <laughs> just hit you hit you up on that because I yeah I, I could talk about Berserk for days on end. Well, I but I, I love Dark Souls too. Chris too. Uh, Dan, I I don't know. Do you remember the cool article that Chris did on um, the Warriors, the adaptation that was made of the oh like, yes the 70s film yeah yeah yeah. Warriors? You yes. have some cool thoughts on adaptation too. So I'll have to shoot that your way. Yeah, there's so well, much. I think it's. A, I mean, that's and, and that's one of the cool things about you know talking about the next stage of video game storytelling. As as you've shown, you're so excited about Camus, right? I think as we get to this point where you know now there's sufficient video game history that games themselves can be doing 
reimaginings and fantastical remakes of the best known video game stories of all time, like Final Fantasy VII, right? There are only going to be more and more interesting, um, you know, roads to travel in terms of adaptation and series based storytelling and all of the stuff that we've been thinking about for a while. And, you know, the, the auteurs and creators like Miyazaki are going to be at the forefront of that. They already are, frankly. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm very excited for that. And I think also um, that I can see that as being a very natural progression of the ideas that you were talking about in your near article, namely um, to, to use your Hamlet example again, right? Like, um, oh, well, uh, it's all well and good to say the Lion King is an adaptation of Hamlet, but I mean, is it though? <laughs> and I think that the, the question then becomes, well, it takes things from Hamlet and it sort of explores similar themes and ideas. So is that what you mean by adaptation? And then taking that into a video game and saying, okay, well, if we're taking that kind of take, I just, I love every part of it. So I won't go on because we will be here for another half an hour if I start getting excited about it, but I really like that idea. <laughs> So at any I rate, the, I th the, one, the one thing I do want to make sure that we explore a little bit before we wrap up here, because I do want to be mindful of time, but, but Camus, you've been so thoughtful in terms of exploring your roots in gaming and the analyses you've done and what you want to do next. Uh, I think what might be fun as a way of wrapping up here would be rounding yourself out a little bit for our audience. Um, you know, I think one of the, the fun things about getting to know our analysts is understanding some of their other interests and activities and what they do in the rest of their time and whether or not they see that as related to their interest in video games, right? Because oftentimes for gamers, right, gaming colors their entire perspective on the world. Other times it's it's just like, you know, as natural and as cordoned off as reading books is for, you know, people who take their literature that way. So who is Camus outside of analyzing video games and how does that relate or not to, to video game Camus? Um, well, the Camus outside of video games is someone who just likes to do a lot of different things. I mean, I, I, I hinted at it with my love of Berserk, but I, I love, I do love anime and, and manga. I, I watch a lot and let's see what else. I, I, I just love analyzing stories. I think it's great. It's just stories teach you about the world in a unique way that you can't find anywhere else. The irony in that though, is that I'm not a huge fan of reading. <laughs> so I, I love to talk about the stories, reading them, not so much, which is hilarious because I can spend 150 hours playing a JRPG. Can't sit down for 20 hours to read a book to save my life though. <laughs> And yet yeah, also, you know, let, let the irony also not be lost that you can write plenty of content about video games that you can then get other people to read. <laughs> we're all we're all just passing the book on reading. That's what it is. <laughs> but why read when you can play the story and read a video this, game? <laughs> you see, this is what I'm trying to hint at. If someone can make a Hamlet video game I, so I don't have to read Hamlet, then my problems are solved. <laughs> This is all about That's the poll quote. Uh, That's the quote for the episode. Yeah. Camus wants a playful <laughs> Hamlet, so he doesn't have to read the damn thing. <laughs> Implicitly, Camus has to read Hamlet by this Friday and is desperate <laughs> to find, <laughs> to find so, something. This is crunch time. This is what industry uh, crunch time is. <laughs> well, oh man. Well, okay. Then I, I'll ask a, I'll ask a question off that because so I, my background, Camus is so I um. I'm a uh, Japanese and religious studies scholar. And, um, you know, people always ask me, what got you into Japan? And the, the honest answer is video games and anime, which I think it is for a lot of people. And that's not what I focused on, but it definitely is like, you know, you grow up with uh, something like Harry Potter or, or, you know, Nickelodeon or whatever. And then you see something like Dragon Ball Z and you're like, well, I, well hey, there's a whole other world out there. So, um, I, my, the question I always ask people is, which came first for you? Was it anime or video games? Oh, it was video games, definitely. It was video games? Okay, me yeah. too. <laughs> I, I got into anime because my sister, she started learning Japanese in like middle school. And and then she just started watching anime and she had, she had a whole phase. And then one day she was like, hey, there's this show do. called Attack on Titan. You might like it. And I watched it and then I went down the rabbit hole. 
here I am today. That's a good one to go down the rabbit hole on. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, I think uh, it's uh, it's been really great kind of getting to know you a bit better and, and uh, going over your work. And I'm really psyched for future things. Um, is there anything that, you know, you'd like to kind of just sort of sign off with or anything in particular you want to let us know about apart from your great work on the site? Um, play Outer Wilds. Just play Outer Wilds. Seriously, <laughs> I can't. I can't say that enough. I haven't met a single person in real life that's actually played Outer Wilds, and it so disappoints me because God, I need to talk about how good it is. <laughs> it shall I be can't done, tell you. Friend. I was yeah, so disappointed how... because I play. I played it in March. Like it's. Let me tell you, it's a perfect game. Like for quarantine time, like, I played it right mm. when it started, and I was like, couldn't it be better. And I had this great idea for i was hoping i would get chosen to give it like a valedictorian speech at my high school and i didn't sadly but i had a great idea to like reference outer wilds and it didn't get picked <laughs> so i couldn't do it it was so disappointed oh, just man. go out there and play outer wilds it is it's worth your time very much worth your time well we have our marching orders that's the top of my list now so good amen all right well then check out um Camus's work on the site He's got the two articles up there. Um, and then I think one land party uh, mentioned too, right? Aren't you in one of them? Yeah. Yes. He was one of the uh, fabled contributors to our rankings of top games. Oh, last right. Year. And he had a mighty fun list. As did you. That's right. <laughs> yes. We had, we had some overlap. So um, okay. yeah, check, check out all the, all the, uh, all the work on the site. Look out for what comes next. And uh, Camus, awesome to talk to you and glad to have you working with us and uh, can't wait to see what comes next. Can't wait to write what comes next. Cheers That's to the that. <laughs> Thank you, Camus. Thanks, everybody.